seem to almost suggest that they come to your countries with a lesser breed of values. No, I don't think I said that at any point, and that's another time you've tried to put something in my well. mouth. But I said, and before we got all confrontational, which you did from the get-go, I said what the problem is here is that these things are all rubbing against each other. Hey guys, welcome back to my channel. Guys, we'll be reacting to Douglas Murray takes on Muslim activists and leave them speechless. Guys, let's get straight into this. Douglas Murray is at it again. This time, he takes on a host of Muslim activists in Qatar over immigration and the compatibility of Islam with Western culture. Douglas Murray did not hold back. Please. Hi, yeah, I'm Hamad Bahawash. I'm a senior at Georgetown University. And my question is to Mr. Douglas Murray. And before I ask my question, I just want to say, you said no sound bites, but then you said the developing world cannot move to the developed world. I don't know what that's about. I think about. I said it before. Uh, my question is, uh, since you brought up migration from the developing world, uh, I'd like to ask you this. Every year, the developed world sends about $300 billion of aid to the developing world, but the developing world sends back trillions in debt repayments uh, to the developed world. Now, um, don't you think that this, is why, that this is the main reason why migrants are moving to Europe? Because money is moving out of the developing world. Wealth is leaving the developing world and moving to the developed world to build on what Lamont Hill said. Don't you think this is why people are moving to the Western world, to the developed world? Well, no, I don't. I don't. Uh, again, I repeat the fact there are no simple answers. And if it was simply the fact that you could, I don't know, do a debt default or something and solve the whole migration issue, then then that would be great. But it just isn't the case. Y you think that if if uh, if, um, for instance, all uh, African countries were allowed to default on debt, that they'd become uh, uh, um, burgeoning, uh, flourishing uh, 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 societies? You think that the problem across, for instance, sub-Saharan Africa isn't just unbelievable? greed and theft by politician True. after politician. You think that, that, that if you just wrote off the debt, that would stop being an issue and everyone would become transparent and clean in their dealings with money? I mean, the problems are much deeper than this. They're much deeper than just a, a simple solution like that. As, if I may just add quickly to the, the previous two uh, comments, the, the, the late, very distinguished American uh, diplomat, Daniel Patrick Moynihan, had a, a wonderful rule he came up with, known as Moynihan's Law, where he said that that uh, human rights, claims of human rights violations often happen in exactly inverse proportion to human rights violations. That is, you hear about them in the countries that are most free. And before long, you can end up with the presumption that the most free countries are the ones who are most abusive of human rights. And this happens with the case when we talk about our leaders and the ones... It's all very well. We can, we can talk about the Trump administration, we can talk about the democracies and, and so on for, for all, we, all we like. We can all make criticisms, and we all should. But, okay, Briefly. Mr. Putin, what are you going to do about him? What are you going to do about the mullahs in Iran? What are you going to do about the House of Saud in Saudi Arabia? You see, what we end up with is this situation. We go, oh, Mr. Trump, Mr. Trump. We can all do that. Believe me, I can riff on but Trump again, all, you're being all quite day. Selective, aren't what you? are you going to do about the people you can't do anything about? Are you going to ignore them? Are you going to give them a pass? Well, or are you just going to enjoy beating well, up on the demo I, I, democracy? I hate to have to can interrupt I? you. There's something called democracy, though, isn't there? Elections. Notice how the woman leading the panel thinks that she has just debunked all of what Douglas Murray has just said by simply referring to democracy. The very crux of Douglas Murray's argument is that most often developing countries tend to have less functional economic and democratic structures internally, such that just getting rid of the debt by itself would not entirely solve the migration crisis. Political instability and conflict within countries can further destabilize economies and endanger lives, pushing individuals to seek safety and stability abroad. The World Bank's reports indicate that political instability and violence significantly impact economic performance, reducing investments and hindering economic growth. This, in turn, exacerbates unemployment and poverty, pushing more people towards migration as a means of escaping untenable situations. This debate is about to get even more heated. Another question, please. Um, so I'm going to talk briefly about you know, my mother's experience as an immigrant, and I want to touch here on something that Mark Lamont Hill said, this power of education and telling people how refugees fit into the wider context of economic development. Here's why I'm very skeptical about that. Because when my mother arrived in the UK and her parents arrived in the UK, people still called them dirty packies. When she had graduated from Oxford University, she was still a brown person who was not seen as a citizen, right? So to what extent can we really sell this idea that being educated or fitting X, Y, and Z criteria 
is what you need to do as a refugee for people to humanize you. The inherent problem with these people is that they don't humanize you. You can't fulfill your oppressor's criteria so that they right. see you as human. So, so how do you humanize people? Dehumanizing refugees, thank you very much. And with this, let me go to you, uh, Douglas Murray. Because much of your uh, argument, Douglas, seems to be about the us versus them, the fact that, you know, we have our own values, our own Britishness, our own virtues, and they will come to our shores with their, she, their values, their tradition. They come to your countries with a lesser breed of values. No, Would I don't you? think I said that at any point, and that's another time you've tried to put something in my well, mouth. Um, so when you talk about the difference the in list. values, what do you suggest? Um, look, uh, uh, first of all, I didn't say that. I said that there are challenges, because we do know that there are challenges, and let, let's, let's just be frank about this. I mean, for instance, I... I've been in, in the Gulf for uh, the last week or so. Uh, I, I've, I see more burqas in my home city of London than I have seen in the Gulf in recent days, certainly here in Doha. Now, I can't say I'm delighted by the, the, the sight of more and more burqas in London. Uh, do, do I feel any hatred of the people who wear them? Of course not, of course not. But I, I can't say I'm elated by it. And definitely there are times I think, you know, what percentage of burqas in this area becomes like, N not that pleasant for everyone else. But again, yeah. is it all down to burqas? Because again, you're not asking people in, with other traditions whether they care about the sight of people drinking alcohol well, or, or well, well, up what, in bikinis. Well, again, well, it's a well, very we could, we could in Western Britain. centric viewpoint. I'm, I'm not, I have to say, you're, you're going to bark up the wrong tree if you think you're going to persuade a Brit that we should stop drinking alcohol because of people arriving in our country. I mean, that's not going to happen. The, these things well, are all a bit of give and take. But they you bring your own traditions that don't quite fit with theirs. Well, they don't. Uh, yeah, there, there, are, there are, as I said, and before before we got all confrontational, which you did from the get-go, I said what the problem is here is that these things are all rubbing against each other. And in that situation, you have to work out what things you're willing to give up, which things you're willing to compromise on, and which ones you're not. You're not going to persuade the Brits to massively change their culture. But let me just make the point. Every single society has certain aspects of it it doesn't want to give up. This one will in Qatar. This one will. Everyone does. So please don't which try to make this values? a kind of bigoted which of your European. But I, I which think of that your would be very very, very dishonest way to, to that'd be a very dishonest but, but way to One of the critical insights to consider in this debate is the difference in foundational values between traditionally liberal Western societies and those governed by strict interpretations of Islamic law. Sure. Western democracies have evolved to place a high value on individual rights, including the freedom of expression and the separation of church and state. This liberal tradition encourages a marketplace of ideas where beliefs and opinions, including those on religion, are subject to scrutiny, debate, and even satire. Murray's concern is that the acceptance or imposition of laws and norms that restrict these freedoms in favor of protecting religious sentiments could lead to a chilling effect on speech and thought. It's a scenario where the fear of offending can stifle creativity, intellectual debate, and the critical questioning of religious and societal norms. This debate is not theoretical, but has manifested in various incidents that have sparked international controversy. By understanding the complex pathways to radicalization, societies can develop more effective strategies to counter extremist narratives and foster an environment where diversity and dialogue thrive over division and discord. Guys, I honestly believe that culture is, is the main reason why some people can fit in some certain places. Like you being in, or you being a Muslim and you being in the UK, you know that if on a normal day, if you're like, you are a Muslim, you're caught drinking, you might be flogged in an Islamic state and you see people drinking alcohol. Or if you're doing drugs, or you see someone selling drugs, like in an Islamic state, you'll be killed. If you're seen using drugs, you might be flogged like a hundred stroke of cane and you pay some fine and stuff like that. But like, I feel the culture, I feel Muslims are trying to push in their cultural values in the UK. And I, I don't think it's bad though, you're trying to like, live your life based on your cultural values it's not but like you're trying to like make everybody like want to live your life you're trying to like i mean choke everybody with your values is not like you came to a state where people have like free will like you can say what you want to say you can do what you want to do you can you can be with who you want to be with and like most people don't really most religious people don't really like agree with those values but like this is 
what they practice so you have to deal with it like it's who they are and you just can't come and change everything based on the fact that you're muslim or you're christian like it does not work that way but guys don't think about this and so like share subscribe to my channel i'll see you next time guys bless